All right, okay, so I'm gonna tie myself to make sure I don't go over here. All right, so thank you again. Uh, this talk is gonna be a JavaScript basics talk. It's part of a series we try to do every month, introducing a new JavaScript feature for new developers and things like that. Uh, so one of the ones that's come up as a topic here that people want to know more about, especially when they're first starting, is using a tool called Webpack. Uh, so this is gonna be as gentle an introduction as I can do. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Mark Bennett. I'm a freelance application developer here in Edmonton. Uh, if you need them, the slides are, are online. You're definitely encouraged to follow along with this if you want. I'll also have this again at the end and I'll leave it up. So uh, if you miss them now, you can get them again later. Uh, and because we are a little tight on time, I just ask that people maybe keep your questions until the end and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer them all in. So JavaScript. Yeah, JavaScript is great. Um, until you go to deploy it and you're hitting all these things where you have to bundle your code together, you've got all these different JavaScript files and you want to be a good developer and put them in one and get a bunch of your resources coming down as fast as you can. Uh, you know, maybe you're minifying that code, compressing it as much as you can. And you also want to be a good developer and use new emerging web standards. So as much as you can, you want to use them, but the reality is that you have to support older browsers that don't. So you need some way to backport new features to old browsers. And doing those things is not fun. Yay, Webpack to the rescue. So that's where Webpack comes in. Uh, it's meant to help with those problems as well as a bunch of others too. <coughs> so essentially what Webpack is, is it's a tool that processes your JavaScript, um, understands the dependencies between them, things like that, uh, and the actual code itself, and packs it up, hence the name Webpack, into a bundle, which you can then distribute with your app. And so the bundle is what you actually go and include in a script tag in your web page, and it has your whole application in it, even if your application is coming from a bunch of files. So just to break that down a little bit more, uh, it's important to understand that Webpack has a sense of the actual dependencies between your files. So whether you're using uh, imports and exports, whether you're using AMD or CommonJS, Webpack can go and analyze those and understand, for example, like here, that main.js is dependent on React, Redux, Rx, as well as the shared library that we've written ourselves. And uh, at the same time, we also say have another file or application for a worker that might be like a web work worker or a service worker, uh, which uses that same, same shared code. Um, and that could include other files as well. So it's essential, I guess, to understand that Webpack is gonna build a model of this that it's gonna work with as it's building your application. So getting started with it is super easy. You can install it directly from NPM. Uh, in this demo, I'm just gonna quickly show how you would install it with Yarn, but you can also use NPM, and in fact, I'll do that um, later on when I'm running some of the other scripts here too. Um, so once you've got it installed, rather than installing it globally, it's a good practice to install it locally just to your project itself, and that way you can be sure you're using a specific version, things like that. So when that happens, it's gonna install it into a folder called node modules in a bin folder there. So to check that it's installed, you can just run version to make sure that it's the version you expect. Um, so getting into this a little bit more, there's a couple concepts that you need to understand to use Webpack effectively. Uh, there's four of them, I'm gonna talk about two of them right now and two of them a little bit later. So the main one that you need to understand to start off using Webpack is the concept of an entry point. So and what an entry point is, is it's a specific file in your code base where Webpack should start trying to understand your code from. So in this case, in our application, we have two entry points. We have main and worker. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna provide those to Webpack, and it's gonna start at each one of those points trying to understand all your code and the dependencies um, so that it can build those into bundles that you use uh, on your front end pages. That's why they're called entry points, is that's where when you're deploying your app, your application will enter uh, the JavaScript. Uh, and in terms of output, there's quite a few different options in Webpack that handle how uh, the bundled files are gonna be outputted in terms of where they go, um, also how the actual contents of the files are generated. For example, here we had a, a shared file. You can go and either have a bundle for each of the entry points that has the whole code base in it, which is a lot simpler to maintain, works well for a lot of applications. But if you start to get a large code base, that shared library can start to get pretty big. And so what you can do is you can set up options where it'll go and essentially pull that out into a third chunk that will automatically get included as well. 
So that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. But just be aware that when you see the output options later on, you're going to be managing how those bundles of files are created, where they end up, and kind of what's in them. So quick demo here. Um, I can swipe over. All right. That. So I've done this properly. So I've already um, done the install because it takes a second. So I've skipped that part. But let's just make sure we've got what pack installed. Great. Okay, and this is actually not the computer that I ever wrote all this code on. So I'm going to have to show you guys that I know what I'm doing, otherwise, it's not going to work. So I'll uh, quickly show you here. I have a simple little app that we wrote. I made it as simple as possible. Basically, what we have is we have two files. We have app, JS, and bar. Um, app JS uses an import statement here to import values, or excuse me, a function from bar. And bar is just this guy right here. Um, it does as little as possible. It's just going to go and say this function was called by these others. So if I run Webpack. App JS. So that's the entry point in this app, right? That's what you would be including in your web pages and stuff like that to start the application. And then you need to give it a place where it will go. So just like I mentioned, a lot of people will put that into a disk folder. You don't have to, um, but that's kind of the convention that people use. And usually they call it bundle. Again, you don't have to, but it helps kind of keep things straight. And works. Yeah, so all it's done, it's gone in here, it's parsed that file, it's parsed the bar JS file, and it's made this. <laughs> and this does not look anything like um, the code that we put in, in app.js and bar.js. And that's one of the things that throws people off a lot when they first start using Webpack. Um, what Webpack is doing is taking your code and it's actually going to go and wrap it in a bunch of other functions that it needs to work. So a lot of the time when you're using Webpack, the code that goes in is going to be transformed quite a bit uh, to produce that bundle at the end. And so usually you can kind of spot some lines from it, like you might see this, you know, the console log line and stuff like that. Um, but other parts of it are going to be a lot more confusing and aren't going to work the way you might expect. So just a heads up as we're, we're going through this, you will see that. Don't panic, it's normal. I know that was when I first first turned into pack. Understanding what that was threw me off a lot. It is readable. It's just not not super straightforward. Um, so now you saw here. I was using these long commands where I had to know node modules bin. That's one of the first things that starts to get a little annoying if you're going to be using this a lot. So there's a shortcut to make that a little bit easier. What you can do is you can use the scripts um, directive inside package.json. So uh, how many people here know what package.json is? Just a show of hands. Okay, so it's basically the file that describes um, an NPM package, and it works with the NPM tool to let you run scripts and things like that related to your project. So all we're going to do is go and edit a package.json, and in here, put in this one line that we'll call node modules for us. And it makes it a lot easier, because then you can just run that specific command um, and not have to type the whole thing over, which is nice. I'm showing this here again with Yarn, because I kind of prefer working with Yarn, but this will all work with NPM as well as Yarn. It doesn't matter which tool you choose to use. So, let me make sure I've got that set up. Yeah. <coughs> I broke it something when I did that check out. <laughs> anyway, my files are still here. Okay. Um, so what I'll do here is npm run. Yeah. So what this is is this is a list of the different things that are in that script. So you can come in here and pick any of these to run. So I can do so dev and does the same thing as when I type that myself. All right. So it's just a little shortcut. It's a little easier to remember that and that whole long. All right, so back to those four concepts. The, the third one that we need to understand is something called the loader. And this is where it starts to get a little more complicated. Um, so basically what a loader does is when Webpack is first reading your files and trying to build them into that tree, 
it uses a loader to go and understand your file, understand its dependencies, um, and copy it over into that tree that Webpack then works against. But people have realized that those loaders don't have to just copy it over into the tree. They can also take your code, transform it, do things like that. Uh, and they can also take things that aren't JavaScript. So you see loaders that'll take things like CSS or images and load them in so that Webpack can bundle them up too. But in this case, we're gonna look at something called a transpiler. And what a transpiler does is it goes and takes new kind of standard-based code and compiles it into code that will run in older browsers that don't support those features. So here we have on the left what would be probably ES2015, and on the right we have something that would work in browsers like you know, Internet Explorer 7 or 8, stuff that don't support those other products. So what's happening is our loader here does the transpile, produces this new code, and then the new code is what it actually loads into that, web, into that Webpack tree. I apologize to you if I say WebKit instead of Webpack. I know I said that at least a dozen times when I was in cursing. So hand-in-hand um, so -hand with loaders are plugins. And basically, plugins do all of the things that you can't do with loaders. Um, when Webpack is running through the build and handling all your files, doing a bunch of optimizations that it does, minifications, and then producing the bundles, there's all these events that get triggered um, throughout that compilation. And plugins can basically be put in and register to interact at any of those different events. I think there's probably one at this point. They're continually adding more. And um, so the idea is that actually a lot of Webpack itself is written using plugins. And uh, so out of the box, there's quite a few plugins that are already loaded in your normal configuration. And you can get plugins to do all sorts of things. They can change the bundles. Um, you know, honestly, anything a loader can do, theoretically a plugin can do as well. So you have. Um, uh, yeah, just a lot of behavior, and I'll show some examples later of what plugins are. But yeah, basically this is the idea is that whereas loaders only happen here when it's first loading your JavaScript, plugins are across the whole process. Um, so at this point, you can still continue to run these commands from the command line, but setting up these configurations is either hard or in some cases there's not command line options. You have to do these with a config file. So the next thing that you'll typically do in these projects is set up a config file. Um, it's called webpackconfig.js by default. You can use a different file if you want to, but um, the interesting thing is that it's actually a JavaScript file, right? So it's not you know, a bunch of settings or something like that. It's not YAML or JSON or something like that. It's JavaScript, and so the cool mm -hmm. thing is your configuration can actually respond to your environment that it's running in. Uh, you, know, you can use all of the kind of interesting JavaScript features that you know and love from your code in your configuration. So, and there's reasons why that's useful, which we'll show later. So this is basically the simplest example that I could come up with. It just does exactly what we did before. Here, we've got an entry point, which is our app.js, and it goes and has an output um, that basically says put it in the dist folder and name it bundle. So if we have more than one entry point, there's actually little substitutions that you can do in here too. And so that you can say, do like entry point name dot bundle dot JS, or you can put in a hash if you want the contents of the bundle, things like that. Uh, if you're gonna be distributing them on a CDN or something like that. Okay, um, so moving that over, we actually make our package JS simpler because we can drop out all those options from um, <coughs> pass into a pack. And for the demo, um, I'll just quickly show again here what we did. So, so this one is a little bit more involved, um, but you can see up here, we've got the entry and the output. Uh, and then down here, there's some loaders where we're actually setting up Babel. I'm using that to do the transpiling, okay? So when you do this, it's actually using that webpack config to run um, and use all the settings in there. Okay, so in terms of adding a loader, you basically just install it how you normally would. You go and use either npm or yarn, pull down what you need. In this case, we need a Babel loader, uh, Babel core, and then Babel uses these different things called presets that help it understand what you're compiling to. And so in this case, we're using a 2015 preset. So you know, basically targeting browsers 
that have been released in the last few years, but maybe aren't with the latest. So you install those, and then in your Webpack config, there's just uh, a little array of loaders. And in there, the interesting thing that they're doing is you have this test here, and that goes and determines which files that loader should be run against. So in this case, whenever Webpack sees a JavaScript file, it's going to go and run this battle loader against it. And um, this query thing is a little confusing to me, to be honest. I don't really like the fact that it's qual called query. Basically, what query is, is these are just options that you're passing into your loader when it's run. So it's sort of like a query string, I guess, on the web or something is where that name comes from. Um, but yeah, it's basically just these are extra options that's going to be passed into the loader that affect how it runs. And most of these loaders, like Babel has tons and tons and tons of these that you can change. Okay, um, so I'm not going to show the demo there. It's basically what we've already done. Um, let's move on to the development workflow now. So one of the things you see is that going back every time you change a file and doing this dev run, build it all again, gets really slow, kind of annoying, not very useful. And um, it's easy to forget too and then be reloading your page and wondering maybe why changes aren't showing up. So WebKit has realized that that's annoying and they have an option for watching for changes. So basically all you do is when you invoke it, you can pass in this watch flag and uh, take care of that for you. So it's very easy. I want to make sure I've got the right command. Yeah. Watch. There you go. So now, instead of running once and then stopping, it continues to run. And the interesting thing, too, is that that tree that it built of all your files is still there in between runs of it. So when you change a file, it's smart enough to know that these are the dependencies that were related to that that I might have to reanalyze, and it can ignore the rest of it. So it makes it a lot faster if you're in watch mode to recompile, and get new changes, and stuff like that. So that's one of the biggest differences then if people are using Gulp or Grunt or something. Uh, they have watchers too, but typically they will go and run the whole thing against the whole code base again, which especially in larger projects gets slower. And this is one of um, the kind of subtle things that really makes a big difference uh, and why a lot of people use Webpack. All right. So the point to production, it's nice to you. Webpack has realized that this is something a lot of people are going to do as well. So out of the box, they have a dash P option that will handle deployment most people 90% of the time. It's going to go bundle up all your files, it's going to minify them, <coughs> and so what that means is it actually looks at the code, eliminates code that isn't used, and will actually re, re kind of structure it to keep the same logic and behavior but make it smaller than it was before. So even just simple things like removing spaces and stuff like that. Um, so and again, easy to set up, we just add a new script with the dash p target this time. Uh, and there are more advanced configurations that you can do here. Uh, you can use the fact that it, the configuration is actually a JavaScript file to detect the environment and do uh, more advanced things. I'm not going to cover that today, but I definitely can answer questions about that if you have them. So I'll just quickly show you here. So we'll stop watching. And actually, here, before I do that, I'm just going to quickly show you one more time. So here you can see our bundle. It's all nice and spread out. It's got lots of spacing. You can see comments and stuff still. All right. So if we look at that again, it's going to be basically illegible. So it's taken all of that and compressed it down to a much smaller human unfriendly size, I guess. So, But that's what you want to send in production. So to kind of wrap this up a little bit, I would say you should use Webpack if you want to use current specs in older browsers along with Babel. Um, you're interested in using web standards rather than third-party libraries. Uh, you have an app where you know, things like the app speed and performance is an issue, so you want to be bundling and minifying your JavaScript code as much as possible. And also if you want to be using things like NPM packages in the browser. So Webpack will give you all those in a, a fairly clean, neat, easy to use package. Um, I would say there are some times when you don't want to use Webpack though. Uh, if you don't need to use these features in older browsers, a lot of the newer JavaScript features have really been implemented a lot more quickly in newer browsers. And so 
pretty much all of ES 2016 is implemented in most of the browsers at this point. Even ES 2017, they're starting to see uh, some of those features are getting picked up already in the browsers as well. So if you're targeting ES 2015, for example, and writing your code in that, you might not need to go and use something like uh, Babel to transpile as well. At the same time, using uh, a lot of these tools will also increase the size of your code, especially using Babel. When it pulls some of these features into um, older browsers, it does things like uh, you'll need to include runtimes. So for example, if you're using uh, like generators or some of the async await stuff, uh, a lot of that you can get working using Babel in IE8 if you want to, but you have to include these extra libraries and things which will add to the size of your application and slow down loading and stuff. So it's not a, a perfect solution by any means, and uh, you should definitely be aware that uh, there could actually, by using this, you could be degrading the core performance uh, of your application. It's doing a lot of that. So in terms of next steps, uh, definitely take a look at the Webpack docs. I used to not really recommend these, but since Webpack 2 came out, uh, a big part of the focus of version 2 was actually improving the documentation. And I'll say I actually found them a lot easier to navigate. Um, they were broken down a lot better into guides, kind of documentation, and then just core concepts. And uh, it seemed like that did a lot to be easier to understand. I really liked this. This is the artsy Webpack source tour, it's called. And uh, I'll just quickly click on it so you can see. I thought this was pretty cool. Um, He's basically gone and taken all of the Webpack source and drawn all over all these different little annotations. And so it's the whole source file. I think it's a few months old, so it's not the latest. Um, but it's a great way if you're using Webpack a lot in production or something and want to understand it. He goes through the whole thing and reading through this, you can actually get a lot out of it even if you're not uh, you know, a hardcore JavaScript developer. So, um, And also this, uh, I don't know, pretty much any project these days, it seems like if you go and um, look up awesome plus the name of it, you're gonna find a repository with awesome resources related to it. So the Webpack one is actually pretty good too. So awesome Webpack is all you have to Google. And it's just tons of resources about different loaders, libraries, plugins, people talk about what they use and what works, maybe what doesn't, things like that. And uh, finally, yeah, Mozilla Neutrino. I just played with it a little myself, but it was a nice way to kind of quickly set up Webpack and Babel and a bunch of the other tools that you might want to use uh, in one command and get it running quickly on a new project. So uh, rather than making all the sponsor stuff. Uh, only thing I wanted to say, just a quick acknowledgement. Uh, Sean Larkin here is one of the um, core contributors to Webpack, and he was super helpful. Uh, just I had a bunch of questions about Webpack that I wanted to make sure I knew answers to before I talked to you. Um, so he was super helpful in terms of helping me do that. So I just wanted to say thank you to Sean. And again, slides are online. I'll tweet this out to you if people want it. So questions? Um, one question, because I found this useful in browser file, just similar to, to, to be able to kind of parse the generated file. I'm assuming a lot of the noise in the webpack file was it doing some level of transpiling. Like you can see the, the your functions were there with transpile things unwrapped. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if that might be useful to know if you're getting into this. You can still see your functions very readably, mm -hmm. and if you're not writing fancy code, mm -hmm. it'll be pretty one-to-one -one usually. Yeah, so one of the things that I didn't cover in this, because it, it is a little more advanced, but WebKit has, a, or Webpack, has really good support for using something called source maps. And basically what they are is they're a file that the browser will load in tandem with your JavaScript when you open the developer tools. And so it'll take that minified JavaScript with all the extra Webpack things in it and stuff like that and convert it back to your original source. So you can go and when you open the developer tools, what you'll see um, is your original source code, even though that's not what's actually running in the browser. And so you can set breakpoints and do things like that against your original source. So um, I, you know, I don't have a slide showing how to set that up, but definitely um, there's a lot of resources in the documentation about setting up source maps. The only thing I will say is there's a couple different strategies it uses um, to set them up. It seems like they're meant for different configurations when you're running it. I would definitely try a few of them because I found every once in a while the source maps would just stop working and um, depending on the strategy we're using and you'd be completely lost in this got all the goop of webpack code. So if you're gonna be using this a lot, especially in production, you can deploy the source maps with your production code and people that aren't using developer tools won't see them at all. And uh, so they won't affect the performance for your customers, but they can be very useful for developers and things like that to access them. So I guess depending on what you're doing, you might not want to do that. 
So can you compare the Webpack with Gulp? Why yeah. Why people migrating from Gulp to Webpack? Right? Yes, I have a slide for that. <laughs> <laughs> I have that question. Um, so that's a, probably one of the biggest questions that people have. And I know when I was first started with Webpack, that was one of the things I didn't really understand. Um, and so what uh, I kind of understand it to be is that Webpack is all about that dependency graph, right? Um, and the kind of model that it loads of your JavaScript files. Right, which is different than what a task runner is going to do. What a task runner does is it basically goes in, sees a set of files, processes them, kind of moves on to the next step, carries on through that until it's you know, built your files or whatever it's going to do. What Webpack does differently is it actually has an innate kind of understanding because of the loaders of the contents of the JavaScript files. And so you can do things like have that watch mode where it's running and actually looking at your source code to understand how changes could be kind of optimized in terms of building them effectively and stuff like that. So it's, it's a subtle difference, but the big thing is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a dependency graph rather than kind of a set of steps that just take your files through from one to the other. Another important thing is that it loads CSS and all sorts of Yeah, it's PHP. Yeah. 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 And it can optimize like to load your page load based on all of that stuff. So it can like move your CSS around. CSS but, but Gulp can do these things as well, right? So. Gulp is a lot of plugin can do all kind of CSS. But, but Webpack uses the dependency graph to uh, okay. figure out. Yeah. Like so is that, is that kind of like a task run is a procedure or imperative, mm -hmm. but the Webpack is kind of functional way to automatically figure out? Yeah, it's a bit more declarative almost in the sense that like you kind of just say, you know, these are my source files, you give them to Webpack and kind of describe what you want, and then Webpack looks at that and determines, in its opinion, the best way to kind of produce that output. Whereas with a task runner, you know, you have to kind of explicitly say, run this, produce that, run this, produce that. So uh, th there's times when actually using a task runner can be more effective, and I do still have products where I use Gulp as well. But um, for, especially specifically for this use case, where you know, you're building bundled assets, uh, whether they're you know, JavaScript, CSS, whatever, to deploy to production. It seems like what Pack is able to get better performance a lot of the time than something like that. Just because of that innate understanding of how they relate to each other and stuff like that. So anyone have experience with a big project uh, compared to Gulp? Uh, or Webpack. Webpack is much faster. Much faster. Yeah. I know with exchangejust.com, even we, like, it's not a huge site, but we switched that one and we noticed a performance difference. I mean, Gulp was pretty good, but it just seemed like Webpack was a bit faster. Any other questions? Uh, about increasing the size of the files, does that mean you get to lose some of the optimization that the text supposed to do? You can, yeah. Like you could certainly, depending, a lot of it actually comes from using Babel in there as a loader. And I mean, it's no fault of Babel. Basically, its job is to support newer features in older browsers. And to do that, depending on the features that you're using, it might need to include more code to support that. So you know, you could have one line in like a, a, like a async await or something like that where you have an async function, and to support that in older browsers, it's going to pull in you know, half a K or something like that of JavaScript to do that. So that's where it's worth looking at it and you know, talking with your team and your business about what browsers are you supporting, you know, what development can I need to do to use, things like that. So. Related to that, though, um, you can also get like file size improvements from using Webpack since it's aware of the whole tree. Mm -hmm. If there's chunks of the tree that you're not using, but maybe your old build system was still linking in because it didn't have a good understanding of your code, yeah. you could potentially slice up whole chunks of your code base so you don't actually need to include. So it's not necessarily guaranteed that you're going to have a file size increase. It could actually shrink it. Yeah, and actually yeah. For, for most people it, sh it should. Like, um, especially if you're not targeting quite old browsers, you probably will see that it does a pretty good job of reducing the process. And in general, like compared to the source code going in, just the minification and things like that will do a lot to reduce the size. So like aside, I guess that maybe that's an implication. Like aside from the stack analysis and imports, is actually the nice if those imports are being consumed and that code gets thrown out. It's my I haven't actually looked at the whole thing of the annotated source there, but it's my understanding that it does. Again, if you do an import, it will understand um, you know what you're importing and if it's being used because it can do it in the newer version. It can do tree shaking now and stuff like that, which I think is what you're talking about, Sean, and eliminate like dead code paths and stuff like that. So and some of that comes like you'll get them. Um, there's a tool called Uglify that's used for a while, which does that within the context of a single file, 
um, where it can look and say, like, if you have, let's say, an if block, and it's like, if false, it knows that that'll never be true, and it'll just prune out that whole chunk of JavaScript and not serve it to like, customers. Um, where Webpack can do that is also go and look across your project and look for JavaScript there, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so this is where it's a file, like, it can detect that just that file on its dependencies need to be processed. This was another question that came up a little bit on Twitter this week when I was kind of fishing around for things. There are some projects still that don't really use NPM or stuff like that, and using those with Webpack is something that a lot of people struggle with a little bit. Um, it's certainly possible. What you have to do is use something called a shim, and basically in your Webpack config, you tell it that you know, jQuery is gonna be available globally as you know, this variable, and then it understands enough to go and make sure that that will be included where it needs to be and stuff like that. All right, any other questions? We'll wrap it up there again. Okay, thanks. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry if this is a bit maybe unrelated, I'm not sure, but no. I just I, I stumbled upon Webpack when I was playing with the uh, Angular 2 CLI, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I was checking it out, and I see like every time I change a file, it refreshes it like rebuilds again. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure that on the browser itself, mm -hmm. it's still the old version. Yeah. Like I'm pretty sure I, I wait for it until it, it finishes, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's just stuck. It doesn't? It's stuck, and I, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't like show the new updates until I restart it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if this, if this is this a, a known issue or? You mean so like Webpack won't detect that the file has changed or reparks it and stuff? No, like actually it detects it's changed, uh -huh. it rebuilds, uh -huh. okay, it stays done, uh -huh. but you refresh the page, yeah. well, it, it refreshes by itself. Yeah. Yeah. You even refresh it, yeah. and it doesn't change. Okay, are you using the dev server? Do you know? Yeah. So, so just there's another tool that we, we didn't talk about here, and I don't know if it's in here. Yeah, so I have it linked <coughs> here. So this is if you um, have a development setup, one of the things that you'll often do is there's the watch that's built into Webpack, which is useful for simpler setups. But it means every time it changes, you have to reload the browser to get the new files. So there's also something that you can use. Um, it's the Webpack dev server. And it basically spins up a server um, that runs Express on your box and will serve the files as you, um, as you need them. But one of the interesting things is it doesn't always serve the file that's sitting on the file system. So what, what I've seen is that it will go and it'll look like you have the latest contents in like the disk folder or the bundle or whatever there, but in the browser you don't see it. And I don't know how to fix this, but usually what I've seen is that it's the dev server that is serving an old kind of in-memory version. Um, and it, I've just fixed it by stopping the dev server and starting it again, and that seems to correct the issue. I'm sure there's a better way of handling it than that, but I, I, that could be maybe what you're saying. I'm not sure. Um, well, like the CLI for Angular, like it, it does use a dev, um, a dev server, but uh, one thing you might be having, I'm not sure, is you might be changing a file that's not actually um, imported in your application. So then it'll, it'll recompile, but it won't change it, and it won't reload, because your actual app in memory can change. Yeah. So like, yeah, you change, you change file, and like, let's say you think it's important in another file, but it's actually not, it's not going to reload on the browser. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's not it, because it's just a hello world, where it says a like, hello world. So I'm changing the, the text, actually. So it's supposed to change. So I've never you know, well, seen it. Why don't you, is it on your laptop? Why don't you bring it in and maybe after the interview uh, we can look at it? I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'd be happy to look at it with you later, though. If, uh, even if you just want to send me a tweet or something, we can send something out. I don't know if this is the case, and I'm a total noob, so maybe I made this mistake that pro guys don't make, but um, I think if you're running the dev server and then you also like Webpack and Bundle, mm -hmm. and then it's actually looking at that um, Bundle JS file instead of the live mm -hmm. dev server, because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that happened before, and then I just deleted the Bundle. Yes, I've honestly had weird experiences with the dev server. It's it's nice when it works, and it's like it because basically what it does is when your files change, it'll update the browser and like reload the browser so you see the changes right away. But it seems somewhere in that loop sometimes things just go on this. So that's why I actually have been using Watch a lot more lately and just putting up the reload on the page. It seems like it's simpler, um, but I guess your mileage may vary. Is what I would say. 
All right, well, why don't we wrap it there? If you have any other questions, I'll be at drinks later, and I'd be happy to take them, or you can send me a tweet and uh, I'll answer it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.